Hi, and welcome to PowerViews. I'm Dan McDade, your host and president of Point Clear. PowerViews is the show dedicated to finding to solutions or finding solutions to some of today's toughest sales and marketing challenges. I hope I'll be able to do a better job, Bob, of introducing you than I did introducing the show. Um, my guest today is Bob Thompson, and Bob is the founder, president, and CEO of CustomerThink.com, the world's number one online community for business leaders seeking to develop and execute customer-centric business strategies. Prior to founding Customer Think, Bob had three decades of experience in sales, technical support, consulting, research, and online community development. And with Customer Think, Bob's goal is to help business leaders understand how to create mutually beneficial customer relationships. In addition to running Customer Think, Bob is a popular keynote speaker, blogger, and author of numerous reports, articles, and white papers. Bob, welcome to PowerViews. Thanks, Dan. It's great to be with you. Yeah, nice to see you again. I think the last time was actually in your neck of the woods a couple years ago almost now, so uh, at a conference in the Bay Area. Yeah. Um, Hey, just before we get into the heart of things, you know, we've just turned the corner for the second half of 2012, and what would you say has surprised you about what has either happened or not happened so far this year? Well, I, I can't say there's been any huge surprises, but uh, it is it's kind of sobering uh, how interconnected we are with other economies. So you, you probably remember the expression, you know, if the U.S. sneezes, yeah. Some other country <laughs> catches the yeah, if, 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 Fran if France sneezes, Europe catches cold. <laughs> yeah, well, now it seems like if Greece sneezes, we all get sick. And, yeah. uh, so it, it, it just goes a long way to showing that uh, we're all interconnected. And, I, you know, that's something I found in, in my research uh, about uh, what it, how top performing businesses do their things so well is that they understand how the different parts uh, of their organization uh, work together. And, um, you know, it, it, to me, it's just the uh, economic malaise and uh, volatility uh, are a bit surprising. I thought that this year would uh, be a little bit stronger. Yeah, and I guess it started out strong, but now all of a sudden, you know, things are starting to get weak again. Though, you know, yeah. it's still a mixed bag. You, every day you pick up the paper, you don't know whether to, you know, cheer or cry. And uh, so I think we need to see how um, the balance of corporate earnings come out. You know, see if the European situation does work itself out. You know, to see if we can get Congress to actually do something between now and the election, which I know yeah. is going to be difficult. Exactly. The politics really do enter into. There's there's so much money being spent on advertising, and it def definitely influences um, how we perceive things are going. I mean, there's some obviously real problems. Uh, the, the you know things like unemployment are, are no joke, but um, it just seems like. Uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, campaigning that will uh, color our perceptions as well. So, right, right. And, and not a lot of action on the part of Congress because they're going to be afraid to to do something <laughs> aggressive uh, because they want to get uh, one side or the other uh, either elected or reelected. So uh, I, I, I think it's going to be a tough environment for businesses to make uh, aggressive decisions until we see how things short, uh, sort themselves out. Well, while we're talking about that, uh, you know, a relatively low percentage of sales reps are going to make quota this year. I think it'll be just over 60%. And actually, uh, CSO Insights talks about that the, you know, fewer sales reps made quota in 2011 than in 2006. Um, what, what do you think about that? What do you think is going on there? Uh, well, we've joked a little bit about that offline, Dan. Um, you know, I, I, I've been on quota uh, <laughs> for uh, probably the majority of my career, one, one job or another. Uh, and, you know, as you and I both know, quotas are set by people that, that uh, are influenced by all kinds of things, and it's, it's not a completely objective process. Um, assuming that managers are, each year are trying to do a responsible job of setting quota, then I would say that it may just simply be a reflection that um, when quotas are set to start the year, companies thought business would be a bit stronger, so they set more aggressive quotas reflecting that. Uh, and that could, you know, play back to 2011 or 2010. I think there's been kind of this, we thought it was going to be a little bit better after we got out of the deepest part of the, uh, the downturn. And so, um, you know, that could be one explanation. Um, so I don't know. I don't, uh, personally think you can, you can, you can use that one metric to grade the performance of Salesforce, but it, again, assuming that, uh, quotas are being set with the same degree of care year after year, 
And uh, then, then perhaps you could start digging deeper to find out, well, what, what are the reasons why uh, uh, reps are missing their flora? Maybe there's some other factors. I think there probably are beyond, uh, you know, the reps themselves. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes quotas are a dream. You know, one of the things that we see in companies is that, um, you know, every year quotas seem to go up. Every year the marketing budgets go down. The requirement for leads goes up. So all of a sudden you have this kind of disconnect or what's often referred to as a lack of alignment between sales and marketing. And I wanted to read one thing um, that, that kind of ties into that, and it's something that you write a lot about and talk about, which is RPM, Revenue Performance Management. And you uh, wrote an article several years ago in B2B Marketing and wrote about the need to engage social buyers and break market, the marketing and sales gridlock and said, you know, progress has been slow and gosh, it's been just painfully slow. But you mentioned in this article, which is a more recent article, now is the time for the industry to rally, rally around RPM as a unifying concept for marketing and sales to work together to maximize revenue. I guess my question, um, and just to get your additional insight onto is, you know, what's happening in this alignment between marketing and sales issue? Is it improving? Um, you know, is it still painfully slow? And what would you expect to have happen to make changes here in the next year or two? Yeah. Well, um, RPM is kind of a new buzzword, and, uh, you know, I can be a little bit sarcastic about some of the buzzwords. I Actually, this is one that I like, and, uh, and the reason I like it is I think that the, um, the sales and marketing community needs to rally around something, and this, area, this issue of alignment and collaboration uh, is hugely important. Mm -hmm. And for it to really work well, there has to be a recognition that it's not just about marketing meeting its goals or sales meeting its goals, there needs to be a senior level executive and I would suggest either the CEO or some senior VP who has marketing and sales who has a revenue goal. Uh, you know, I know how quotas are get, quotas are not the same as uh, revenue. Uh, in fact, sales are not the same as revenue. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of games that are played to translate a uh, revenue goal into what a rep or even a, a manager of reps sees as his or her quota. So uh, you have to just take a step back and say, what is the point of a business? I mean, at least one of the goals is to maximize profitable revenue. And so marketing, marketing and sales collaborating to do that, I think, is a very important strategic initiative for companies. And RPM is at least, at least in the current, um, so I would call it the 1.0 release of, of the idea, which is really a derivative of CRM, uh, to, be, to be candid. This, this, this current um, uh, view of RPM is really about how do you uh, optimize this marketing and sales process. And I, I think whether you use that term or not, that there, there has been some progress over the last uh, two or three years. At least that's what I'm hearing when I talk to people who study um, or closer to marketing and sales than I am. You know, I'm working on a few different things. I'm not out there uh, personally interviewing uh, sales and marketing leaders all that often. But the reports I'm getting are things are improving. And I think part of it's been a better job of this optimization, but I think another part of it is clearly that customers are driving a more of this integrated approach. I mean, ultimately, it's customers that are driving change. Mm -hmm. it's, it's generally, in my experience, not been the case that companies have a flash of insight and say, hey, we ought to do something different. It's customers are really breaking down these silos and forcing companies to take a fresh look. And RPM, to me, is really embodying uh, how companies are be, uh, reacting to that uh, change from customers. You know, that's a really, it's a great segue into the next question I was going to ask because it talks about inbound and outbound marketing. You know, there's been just a flood of uh, marketing activity in the driving inbound marketing, and I think both you and I agree that marketing can have a little bit of an over-dependence on technology when it comes to marketing. And you wrote an interesting blog. This is actually back in March, but it was talking about how do prospects score you on their experience. So to your point, it's really the customers that are driving. I know that's an area you're passionate about. It's customers that are driving change. And what you say in that article is that what you're advocate, advocating is to take time out from scoring your prospects on their ability to satisfy your needs and instead spend time to really understand how your prospects, all of them, perceive their experience with your brand. 
And it, you know, I think that's kind of at the heart of this inbound and outbound marketing discussion. You know, how do you get, you know, get closer to the clients or the prospects desires and, you know, how do you match up with them? And I don't think it's necessarily all about sending out a bunch of emails and hoping for the best. But what do you think? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the ideas are related. I mean, uh, uh, I, I think inbound and outbound both serve a, a, a role. And inbound hasn't displaced the need to be proactive. Um, I, I think there's a, there's a deeper, more important issue. Uh, as I look at, I mean, if you think about what consumers are doing, and they are definitely searching more, and uh, maybe not in every case, but in many cases, they are being, uh, they're much more prepared and informed. And one could argue further along the traditional sales process than, than they were five years ago. Mm -hmm. okay. I think there's a fair amount of research that supports that idea. Um, you, if you take that to a logical conclusion, you say, well, if the sales, if this, the, the marketing and sales response to that is just the same as it's always been, what does that mean? Well, it means that, that the role of the sales rep, if they're just dealing with these leads being generated by the, the um, you know, marketing automation activities, uh, primarily content marketing, uh, is to be, you know, super closing machines, right? They're, they're going to have a, a marginalized job that says, well, we're only going to have reps work on things if the algorithm says they should. And, you know, there's been a lot of conversation on, on customer think and other communities that suggest, well, that could be a really dangerous place for sales to be because now you're in a position where the customers decided exactly what they need, or at least they think they have. They, in fact, have a short list of solutions, and now it's just, hey, what's your price? And, you know, you don't want to be no. in that position as a sales professional. So that's why I think that in that that's going to happen. I mean, th that trend is going to happen and play out regardless of whether we like it or not, that uh, products that can be understood on, uh, online and, and so forth are going to result in these, uh, I call it lower value add sales activities, somebody is going to have to handle those and I would submit that's probably going to be more um, uh, telesales doing it. But I think that is a very dangerous position to be in and that to me uh, says that there's an even greater need for two things. One is this proactive outbound relationship building and not in the sort of namby-pamby way that the challenger sale positions relationship like being your buddy but but reps that really can look at a business, identify business problems, identify key decision makers that they, they over a period of time can be a source of business, and then proactively developing a relationship with those people such that they can uh, create demand for new solutions, position what the company can do, and uh, you know make sure the RFPs get get written <laughs> uh, in the way that uh, is most beneficial and so forth. All those things that you and I both know is, is what uh, the top reps do in uh, complex B2B. That's certainly what, what I learned when I was at IBM. Uh, I, I worry that companies are going to become so dependent on this, this the technology and content uh, management and lead generation that they'll forget those basics. Uh, now, maybe I'm uh, worried. Maybe I'm worried that the sky is falling and it's not really falling. But um, uh, I think that uh, there's been some history of believing that technology is going to solve all of our problems. And I still think that there is a critical role for uh, sales professionals, and and that means that they need this better sales acumen. They need better business skills. And to be able to create the demand and be more proactive and outbound, and that's raising the game. It's something else that I've written a lot about is that this this is really the challenge for 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 the sales profession in general. Is um, you know they can't replace technology, but they can find uh, roles that technology can't fulfill, and that means you know being more proactive. Yeah, I think I, my personal opinion is right now there's a lot of focus on marketing, and for marketing to become relevant, I think eventually that might turn around and sales is going to have to become relevant. And the reason I say that is you brought up the challenger sale a few minutes ago. Um, you know, one thing that the corporate executive board has studied over the last couple of years, which I think is interesting, is is that they say average sales reps um, tend to kind of flock towards inbound leads and are very reactive, where 
you know, the more successful sales reps are proactively reaching out and, and not so much building a relationship and being a buddy because they even say in that book that, you know, nobody needs more friends. We already have more friends that we can stay up with, you know, so. Well, I can use a couple more friends. Yeah. But, no, <laughs> I, 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 uh, I take your point. Yes. I mean, but, certainly customers are, uh, are not looking for, for more buddies. So certainly <laughs> most of their vendors they wouldn't consider friends. Exactly. But, you know, what they are looking for is they're looking for somebody who brings value to the relationship. And, you know, you read it over and over again. But, you know, when back when you were with IBM and in my previous career, you know, that one of the things that we did to bring value is we solved problems multiple times when many companies only solve them once. So, and a good reason for a senior executive to talk to us is because, because of that and because they have to be a little bit suspicious or they, at least they should be suspicious of internal agendas and if nothing else validate what they're getting internally and, and you know as far as the challenger sale there's certain things I don't agree with but one of the things I do agree with is if you've got a situation where the buyer is theoretically 70% of the way through the buying process through their own web research how can you reset the process so that you can add value and make sure that they don't take the wrong turn which they made through their own research and yeah, you know, I think yeah. that's an interesting concept yeah, I mean, that's something I'd like to see studied more because, um, you know, that, that's one way that companies can uh, maybe turn turn the tables a little bit and not just be the um, the tail that's getting wagged, if you know yeah, what I'm saying. <laughs> exactly. Um, the, the other thing that I would suggest is that um, there's this kind of notion that I, that I picked up that, um, uh, and not to put too fine a point on it, but you know, this is kind of a power play for marketing, too. Uh, then in B2B, that there's been a little bit of the red-haired stepchildren, uh, and apologies for anybody who <laughs> is red-haired and a stepchild, but, what, you know, being sort of in a, in a less powerful uh, role within the company because, you know, sales is the one that's making the sale and the revenue happen, and marketing is there to run the campaigns and be supportive, but, you know, in the end, it's the rep that gets the credit. Right. I'm not sure that's going to change very much over the next few years, but there is an, an increasing awareness that marketing plays a more important role because of how, how customers are approaching their buying. Um, and RPM, I think, and it, it is a way for marketers to earn more value and more respect within the company. But I think there's another tangent to that, 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 that sales professionals... Uh, can add value to marketing. And that's the part I haven't seen too much about. Mm -hmm. now, why can't sales professionals that have been working in a large account for 20 years, let's say, or in an industry for a long time, they've seen lots of problems, lots of solutions, they, they have a good sense about what is broken, how it can be fixed, uh, and yet you never hear from them. Mm -hmm. Why aren't they interviewed by marketing more so they can create the content that will cause the company to pull in people who care about those problems. Why don't some reps blog? I know it's a controversial idea. It takes time and so forth, and it's not for everybody. Not everybody can write, but there are ways to uh, provide content to other people who are writing, so input to articles and white papers and such. There are ways to, to blog for those who have the, the chops to do it. You can tweet. So this idea of, of reps as, a, as part of the content generation plan, I think, is one that needs uh, some work as well. And this is all, part, to me, part of marketing and sales working as a team and not just two organizations that are, you know, passing data back and forth. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you um, really two questions at the same time here because I think they're, they probably are somewhat related. You know, one is, uh, what have we missed? Is there anything in particular that you want to talk about today that we haven't talked about? And the other thing is the new book that you're working on, um, which is called The Five Habits of Customer-Centric Business Leaders. And uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about the book and see if there's anything you feel like we've missed that we should have talked about today. Well, I mean, t to me, uh, as I said earlier, I think RPM is kind of in a 1.0 stage, which is, uh, fo it's focused on marketing and sales. It's really about process optimization. I think all that's to the good, but I think there is an RPM 2.0, which is really about, again, not a new idea, but about the sales experience. It's about how do we make the, the experience that customers have when they, inter when they interact with our, our, you know, our prospecting process in marketing and sales such that even if they don't buy, 
they they believe it was a good experience. That they mm-hmm. would be willing to say, you know, I didn't wasn't a good fit for that company, but I would recommend them because I really like the way they handled me. And uh, and those that do buy also feel very strongly. And this is uh, has a, a perhaps a less direct and short term uh, benefit than the sort of process approach. But I would argue that strategically, the very top companies are going to be as, as concerned about this, which is really more about the art of the sale, about how these interactions, whether they're online or with the sales professionals as, as people, how are these perceived? Is it a great experience that is going to create a more loyal and emotional response? Uh, or is it, um, you know, these reps talk to me as long as I'm buying something. and so. You know, I'm sure it's all <laughs> it's all very efficient, but you know, it, it, I just bought a solution. I did not really buy into this relationship, and I think the top brands, if you think about the very best B2B, they get that, and they're they're doing that now. They don't make a big thing about it. I think the uh, the dilemma that some of the other companies are going to face is that after they optimize, they spend the next two or three years optimizing, they're going <laughs> to still be behind yeah. <laughs> because there's more to it than that in my, yeah. in my opinion so that's the thing I think um, if, if it's if not been missed but it's been uh, I think the next thing to be developed um, and in, in terms of my book you know what I found um, the book is really about uh, what, uh, what are the behaviors that companies um, exhibit routinely habits so if you think about habits, it's not something you do once, you know, because you felt like it. It's something you do over and over again, and many times you don't even think about it. You just do it because it's a habit, whether it's drinking coffee or, you know, how, how you organize meetings at work, how you pay people. So companies, the, the habits really define the culture of a company um, when you get right down to it. It's the things that we do and, and how we reward people. and uh, So... Uh, the, these five habits, there's five of them, and I'll just quickly mention them because I think that they, they do have applicability uh, in marketing and sales for companies that will take a more long-term view and not just about, you know, how do we ratchet up sales in the next quarter. So not, habit number one is listening and really understanding what cust- not only what their customers are saying but what their true needs are. And I think if you look at the Challenger sale and, and other leading books, you see that the top reps dig deep and they don't just depend on doing exactly what the customer said they wanted, although they'll certainly listen, but they dig deeper than that. Uh, right. Habit number two is is about, um, well, I call it think. It's really about being more analytical. And in some cases, um, companies make decisions out of habit, out of politics, for lots of reasons that don't actually make a whole lot of sense. And there are ways to use technology and analytics to make better fact-based decisions. And I'm an advocate of that, uh, not as a replacement for human judgment, but as an augmentation. Uh, habit number three is to empower employees, information, tools, uh, uh, policies like being able to spend money in customer service. There's lots of ways you can do that. Uh, but um, we know in our research that customers really value dealing with empowered employees, not just those that you know, have to go ask the boss uh, if they can, whether it's negotiate the price or, uh, you know, give a refund or whatever it might be. Um, habit number four uh, is about innovation. I call it create. How can you take what you, you've learned in these other four, uh, excuse me, the other three steps and actually do something different? A lot of companies really struggle. They know they should change, but they just can't. They they can't create the new product. They can't make the product change. They can't take uh, change policy and the, the best companies in my research they're able to create something new and then uh, habit number five is to be able to deliver that change in a way that is delightful to customers so is this are these five habits uh, necessary to make some money and perform no uh, but uh, the top companies are very good at all five that's what I found and they're they're interrelated. It's not about picking one or the other. It's not just about using analytics or just voice of customer or, uh, you know, just try, trying to wow your customers. It's really more of a systematic approach to bring these together. And I think there are um, applications in marketing and sales. Uh, but 
I think they have to look at it again as a team and not as two uh, two organizations. Uh, again, as I said, just passing data back and forth. Yeah, absolutely. When's the book come out, Bob? Uh, in November. Okay. Yeah. And uh, will it be available through all the usual sources? You think, or? Yep. Yeah, it should be uh, the usual channels, uh, but uh, you know, primarily Amazon. Okay, great. Well, that leads me to uh, asking you if you wouldn't mind telling our audience how they might get in touch with you if they've got a question or want to follow up on anything they've heard today. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, uh, pretty easy to find. Uh, go to www.customerthink.com. Uh, that's the community I started. Um, well, let's see, it's now 2012, so it's uh, 12 years old. Uh, original name was CRMGuru.com. We uh, renamed it to Customer Think in 2007. So, uh, Certainly, anyone uh, is welcome to visit. It's free, and um, you can find me there. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Bob underscore Thompson, and uh, people certainly can email me at Bob Thompson, Bob at CustomerThink.com. That's great, and I think I have the number right, but as a testimonial to CustomerThink.com, I think you have about 80,000 readers. Is that right? Well, we, had, we get uh, around 80,000 uh, visitors your website each month, and we've got about 50,000 people on our email list. We have people on RSS. We have thousands of people on Twitter. So we, you know, people can reach us all kinds of different ways. But in the end, we get about 80,000 visitors each month. Okay, well, that's terrific. Well, I can you can count me as one of your readers and one of your fans. I really appreciate all you do. I want to say thanks for being with me today, Bob. I really appreciate it. Great, my pleasure. Well, for now, this is Dan McDade signing off from another edition of Power Views. Thank you for watching.